and welcome to Mission Unstoppable. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> I got a great show. I'm so excited. Today I have with me Mike Anthony. You can raise his hand. He has been a part-time professional actor, full-time not professional bartender, so he says, in New York City. And it was his role in the latter that he was lucky enough to experience a phenomenal ride that was Hamilton, an American musical. And he watched how it rocketed into Broadway history. So excited was he, he wrote a book called Life at Hamilton, chronicles his extraordinary time there. But beyond that, the reason we are here with him today is that Mike's journey took an unexpected turn when his father passed away. It led him down a remarkable path of spiritual discovery. He now spends a good portion of his time exploring evidence, suggestive of the survival that consciousness uh, does, does exist beyond the demise of the physical body. And as part of Mike's story, you will see him in the documentary series, Surviving Death. The beautiful blonde with me today is Angelina Diana, and she has been working as a psychic medium since 2001. Before that, she had a career in radio as a newscaster and a host. Huh, not unfamiliar, right? In fact, that's how Mike's sister found out about her. She was giving readings on air. And Angelina has a distinction of being the first medium to be certified by Forever Family Foundation. It's an organization that is also featured in episode four of Surviving Death on Netflix. And when they began their program in 2005. Diana also participated in the prestigious Mediumship Afterlife Test. It was a Veritas research program under the direction of author and scientist Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona in Tucson. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Angelina hopes to be a resource for those who want to discover their own psychic abilities and to help those who have experienced loss to connect to their loved ones. Now, I, we were trying to figure this out before you got on, Mike. What, do you remember what year it was that Jen went to see Angelina. Yeah, it was the year my dad died, 2011. 2000 and, oh, right, yep, okay, 2011. And so let's, let's just talk about that for a moment. You're, you're bartending in the theater that night, you get a call, T yeah. take us through that call. Yeah, my, my, my dad was uh, only 60 years old and he was a young 60, too young. you know, too, yeah. too young. And we thought he had many, many years to go, so this came as a complete shock. I, I'm, I'm bartending, and uh, in, in the show that I was doing had two intermissions, and it was just before the first intermission. My phone rings, and it's my sister. So I answered it, and she's wailing, she's screaming, um, asking if my dad is with me, and I'm saying no, he's definitely not. Anyway, and then just before the second intermission, the phone rings again, and it's my sister saying, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. Um, the, he had not shown up for work that day, and a worried coworker went to his house. And uh, that's how we discovered that he had walked into his house 10 minutes after leaving me, by the way, we had been watching a, a Monday night football game together. And then he drove around the corner, walked in the house, went up the stairs and then died. He, he still had his keys in his hands. Um, so it, that's how much of a shock uh, it was. Unbelievable. And did they, did they have a reason for his, his death? Was it an aneurysm? They don't know. He never did autopsy. We we did not do an autopsy, according to Angelina, uh, who I now trust implicitly. Yeah. I didn't at first. It took a long time. I know. I, put, I always I, want to slap you upside your head reading your book. <laughs> I, I can't believe she didn't. I mean, I put her through the ringer. Uh, and uh, Angelina's first impressions, which she might not probably doesn't even remember at this point, was that it was something very fast, which is exactly how it looked, uh, maybe starting behind his eyes. So may, maybe a stroke or possibly an aneurysm, you know. He still had the keys of, in his hands, didn't he? He did. It yeah. looked the way that he was found on the ground. It looked almost like he may have gotten dizzy and then sort of kneeled on the ground and then and then just laid back. His knees were bent up, you know, almost like yeah. he intentionally laid down on the ground. So something. Wow. Like, yeah. Well, I know it's been a while, but I'm very sorry for your loss. Oh, thank you. That's I'm I'm it's OK. Yeah, I know it's OK. But anyway, it's it's at the beginning. It's very hard. So um, something very strange happened. A cousin called your mother and said. Yeah, uh, I had, you know, mediumship is something I was only vaguely aware of from the show uh, Crossing Over with John Edward at that time, which was yeah. on television when I was in high school. Um, so only like a day or two after my dad had been buried, uh, a phone call comes into my house and this stranger, a woman we to this day that we've never met in person, um, got in contact with contact with us to say that my dead father out of body 
was tapping her on the shoulder, desperate to get a message to his family uh, that he was okay, that he had survived the death and that he was okay. And he, he told her his name was Robert and that this uh, was connected to a family that somehow had a fish restaurant in the family. And uh, she called my second cousin saying she thinks it's connected to him. A, a second cousin who I was not close with. I couldn't even picture this guy when my mom first said, you know, Chris called and I got this crazy name. I was like, Chris, who, who is that? And uh, so that's how medium, that's how mediumship was uh, dropped into our lives. It, came, right. it was like this external thing. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I guess your dad's going, who do I know? Who do I know? Who do I know? <laughs> that's what it seemed like. That's what it seemed like. He was just like desperately looking around like, okay, you. She was the closest one with any kind of connection. Yeah, yeah. Angelina, isn't it a little unusual for a newly departed spirit to have that much strength, I think, to try to come through? Is that unusual? I don't, I don't believe that. I believe when somebody crosses, you are actually in a better place and actually stronger than you were physically. When the physical brain gets weaker, the spirit gets grander mm -hmm. and our spirit is contained in our body. So I feel it's usually the grieving that have a hard time receiving from spirit. Okay. Spirit, I believe, can communicate instantly. As a matter of fact, I've done readings where... I find out later after the reading that the person that I'm connecting to in spirit actually has stage four Alzheimer's and they haven't been present here for years. Right. So the brain got weak, but their spirit has been in heaven for quite some time. So to me, once you cross, you're there. And, and actually, I know it's hard for us to want to think of this, but they are in a beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always thought that, that some people had to do a, um, a reset, like a healing of their soul, a healing of their spirit because of the life maybe that they had led here. Like, well, well I do. Well, I'm sorry. No, um, no. But like, I, But I do believe that we do go through that. But to me, it's think of how we live everyday life. You know, we, you and I see each other right now, but there's energy being exchanged. Sure. So we're constantly exchanging energy. So when somebody passes, I believe that it, there's an instant reconnect and they feel what the griever feels. Oh, you miss me. But they also have a, 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 a breath. No pun. I don't mean to be disrespectful, yeah, but it's, no. it's really like a breath of, an, of a new way of looking at things sure. and feeling so they can connect with the living. But they're also looking at, look at the good that I've done. Oh, here's how I may have disappointed you. So I believe the life review is actually done in two different places with the living because they can feel them instantly. And they know, like, I'm sure when Robert passed, he went, I'm a good dad, you know, because he knows how much Mike and he connected. Yeah. And that was instant. And let's just say, for example, when he crossed, he met over with some relatives that he never knew. And maybe there was a relative who wasn't a good dad. Well, guess what? Robert gets to do his life review with that relative and teach them how to be a good dad. So you're doing it instantaneously, in my view of what spirit has shown me. Does that make sense? It does. But I, I'm just curious, though. Do you think, um, Mike, that your dad wanted was so desperate to come back because he loved you guys so much that he wanted you to know he's OK? Like, oh, they're, they're going to be freaking out. This is going to be so wild. It's like I'm too young. Like, I'm OK, but I, I need them to know I'm OK. Yeah, my, my dad was an extraordinarily decent human being. Um, just well above average, you know, like I, I, my dad would have done just fine as like a monk in Tibet living on a mountain. He was that level of, 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 uh, he had this deep innate spiritualness to him, this incredible love. Um, I used to think he was an angel when I was a little kid. I actually asked my dad once, dad, are you an angel? When we had first started to learn really? about angels. Yeah. So Aww. we were so devastated that we really, we, I, I was in a full-blown existential crisis thinking there's no reason to go on with life. Not, not that I was suicidal or anything, but yeah. I just could feel no meaning to anything. Because someone, your dad went. Yeah. If someone like that could disappear, then what was the point of anything? And I, if anyone uh, would have gone to any lengths to lift his family out of that morass, it would have been my father. Did you ever feel as, I mean, I know I've thought this many times throughout my life. You go, one day I'm not going to be here. Like, I'm just not going to be here. Like this, this is not here anymore. And it's such a weird thought in a way to think that you'll never, I mean, all the people who came, only some of them are remembered, you know, of yeah. all the people in history, there's a few who made their mark, but for the most part, you know, you just go down, eh, 
you, you know, that's it. Yeah, it's some- family's gone, you're gone. And it's such a weird thing. That, why was I here yeah. for 70 years or whatever it is, right? I used to think about that all the time. Even as a little kid, it was sort of on my mind. Um, and, and you know, I, as I write about in the book, I, I've loved science my whole life as well. And what science says unequivocally in mainstream science is that when you die, that is it, period. You're gone. Uh, everything that is happening up here that gives us the illusion of self is chemical reactions. And when the brain stops getting oxygen, so does the sense of self go away. Um, so that struck me, you know, that hit me heavy when my dad was gone. For my whole life, thinking about the idea of death was always kind of in the background, but I'm able to push it away and live my life happily most of the time. But when my dad died, now, I'm, now, now it's hitting me in my face. Um, and uh, if, you know, now it feels like it all, it all happened for a reason because it, it then sent me down this path I am now happier than I've ever been, as strange as that might be, uh, might sound, because I literally have no doubt that my dad is f- literally here. And in, in a physical sense, I mean that. Not physical, yeah. maybe as we understand the word, yeah. but in some day, maybe science will- In an die. energy form behind you. He's here. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think people are starting to get that a little bit more because you have more people who, you know, Reiki, who send energy across, you know, great- distances. Um, you have the people who, I mean, there's so much going on in, in the world of, you know, what do you want to ever call it? The psychicness or whatever. Uh, I don't even know what I'm going to call it. Metaphysical world. Um, you know, I, I remember I studied metaphysical hypnotherapy and it was very interesting. You know, I, I loved it. Um, but I'm interested in all kinds of things. And I've had many, many people on the show who, uh, Dr. Phyllis, um, you know, she, she interviewed over 4,000 people who had near-death experiences. So it's, it's, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on that we don't know and can account for, but it's there. What about you before you, you know, before I need to find out how Angelina, how did this come about for you? Because I mean, like you were a photojournalist, you were, you know, in the radio and then boom, one day you wake up and, oh, I'm a psychic now, (laughs) like a medium. (laughs) How did that work for you? Well, I don't believe it works that way, although there, there might some co- be some colleagues out there and, and maybe even purported psychic mediums that think all of a sudden psychicness is just dropped in their lap. But I, I believe that we're all born with this ability. Um, it's not a gift. I think a gift is something you get a sweater. It stays a sweater, right? Um, it's an ability. And for me to see my journey, it, at least came out that way for me. When I was a little kid, I used to have um, little night terrors and I used to have these little prediction things that would happen. And I I predicted that the Hartford Civic Center imploded, you know, and I woke up, I was a little kid and my mother's like, you saw that happen? Oh, guess what? It happened. And my grandmother used to read me with a regular deck of playing cards, but my mom would make me do the rosary because she was afraid, you know? So I had this dichotomy in my family And so I brought fear on. So I believe if we interject fear, that's a product of the mind. Fear is based on something that hasn't happened yet, but it does make us shy away. Yeah. So it wasn't until the late nineties, I was doing morning show radio and Springfield, Massachusetts. And the morning guy said, Hey, let's get a couple of psychics on. And I'm like, Oh, sure. Oh, but you can't talk about it. You're newscaster you have to be credible and I'm like oh but my grandmother used to do like I was very open about it but I couldn't talk about it so I silently and quietly started smudging the the newsroom and like because I started to really get into everything and I got fired over it because they're like oh you're doing that witchcraft stuff long story short long story short I I decided just for blanks and giggles to read other people because I started to put it into my life and other people were like, Hey, you helped me. I, I, I did. I want another reading. Oh, you want another reading? I want to be Barbara Walters. What's the matter with you? Like, you know, I was kind of pushing it away, yep. but the more I understood energy and psychic ability and that we all are unique. There's no one like us on the planet. They'll never be again. And that's born out of what's essential about each of us. We have a uniqueness and I, I started to understand, you know, that's unique about me. I want to help people. And it seems like I'm, I'd, I'd rather drive three hours to Long Island to do a psychic fair than do the news in the morning. I guess this is it. So I said to myself, if I continue to help people, I'll stay in the field. And that was back in 2001. So it discovered naturally. And I feel 
like with Mike, he's such an extraordinary human being. He's very loving, but he's very smart, very scientific. And it's wonderful to have someone like he discovering this and being vocal about it because he he's had very doesn't know this but he's had very psychic moments with me where I'll um I'll be like thinking about him and he'll text me and I'll be like ah yeah, yeah, he picked up on it you know so it shows that even someone with a scientific mind like him can open up to this so no matter how unique we are we're all psychic we we can get a sense of the future and we're all mediumistic if you're missing someone you can connect to them too. So that's what I've discovered um, in the last, what, 20 years? <laughs> so, well, it's been a it. while. It's been it. a while for me. <laughs> Mike, your dad left a lot of clues. It's amazing how many clues he left for you. And, you know, if you were playing a game, <laughs> you could add it all up. But your, your mind was so skeptical and so, you know, rigid in, in, in that, oh, this has to be, it has to be like a perfect has to be perfectly, you know, uh, viable and identifiable and quantifiable and uh, put performance measurement, you know, to it and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it was, it was, sometimes it was hard to read your words. <laughs> and I, mean, I was just like, ah, like have a bit of faith. Um, but that's okay. Because now, you know, you were such a firm believer that, that you could talk to the greatest skeptic in the world and, and they would have to believe you because how could they not? So I want to start with the first interesting thing was the song Believe. Yeah. Believe, Mike. Just believe, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I picture my poor father. You know, every time something amazing would happen in the moment, we'd be like, oh, my goodness. You, there's no way you can explain that away. That's incredible. He's still here. And then an hour later, we're like, okay, dad, can you do one more thing though? You know, one more thing. And Just this went on you. for years. So my poor father must've been like, oh my God, give me a, when can I sit down <laughs> for goodness sake? But um, yeah, the first, the first thing was this, <clears throat> we were cleaning out his house and my dad was a messy, um, he was not organized it, the way that he kept his notes and things. So he had this little home office and his desk was full, piled high with scribbles and it was all hand scribbled. My dad wrote everything down. Um, and we found this little scrap of paper that had been torn off with a little note on it that said, believe, tell Jen, Jen is my sister. So we didn't know what to make of that. Um, and then, you know, an hour or so later, further down in the pile, there's another scrap of paper that says, believe a country song. So my dad loved music. And a lot of times he would share his feelings for us with music. Like one time when we were kids, he put us in the back of a car to go for a, uh, to go for a drive. And he put on the Carol, Carol King song, Child of Mine. And he said, I want you to, to listen to these words. This is how I feel about you. Um, so he communicated with music a lot. So we when we found these two notes, it broke our hearts because he had forgotten. He must have heard the song two different times and meant to tell my sister about it and forgot to do it. Um, the next morning, we we're getting ready for the wake and my mom wanted to have some music playing uh, at the wake. So we decided to make a playlist. And as we're sitting there in her living room, I, I remembered the notes and we said, oh, let let's you know, go to iTunes and look up Believe uh, in country music. And it's this Brooks and Dunn song. And as it turns out, the song is about um, a man who believes without question that life goes on after death. And that even though he lost his wife and his child um, earlier in his life, he knew that he was going to see them again. Mm -hmm. So that alone was striking. What are, I mean, how many songs are about death and life after death? Not all that many. And the fact that that happened to be the subject of that those two notes that we found. And by the way, it wasn't like my dad had found it the day before. This song was at that time, it was seven or eight years old and none of us had ever heard it before, by the yeah, way. Yeah. It was not a song we'd ever heard. So anyway, we put it to the on the playlist and the next morning we're driving to the to the funeral and, um, you know, ready to, to bury my dad. And I'm thinking, you know, one of the last lines in the song is, uh, you can't tell me that it all ends in a slow ride in a hearse. And as I'm taking that slow ride behind the hearse, those, those words are playing in my head. 
So that would have been, you know, interesting enough. But then uh, not long after that, I was driving back to New York City where I lived and worked. And for the first time, I was alone after my dad's passing. And it all hit me, you know, up until that point, we're involved in the busyness of making the plans Mm -hmm. and everything and sort of in that state of shock that people can go into. But on this drive, it suddenly hit me. So I'm weeping in the car like I can barely see where I'm going. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm totally devastated thinking, I, I, I don't know how I can, how I'm going to go on with life. Now, at that time in my life, I always listened to my, I always had my phone with me and listened to my own music. You know, I would plug my phone into the USB thing. I did not have the strength that day. So for the first time in a long, long time, I did not plug the phone in and the radio just happened to be on in the background at a low level. Um, Not that I turned it on, it was just on, you know? And as I'm weeping, I hear the strains of this song and I'm thinking, that cannot be, that can't be. And I'm afraid to turn it up, you know, because if it is what I think it is, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to control this car, you know? And I turn it up and sure enough, it's that song, it's Believe. You can't tell me it all ends in a slow ride in a hearse. And suddenly those tears of of sorrow turn instantly to tears of, joy and like ecstasy. And I call my sister. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. And I'm screaming and I'm having her listen to it. Um, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary moment. Uh, but then of course the next day, my, my old, the old brain is going, well, what about, you know, but that was the first sign, remarkable sign. Yeah. Yeah. And the butterfly, the butterfly in the theater is kind of interesting. And the butterfly was significant because you guys watched this butterfly at the last barbecue that you had with your dad, right? Yeah. The, the night he, he actually passed away. Um, enter, and enter um, you know, Angelina. Your sister hears her on the radio. She's driving. She hears her on the radio. Oh, there's an event. I'm going to take my husband and my, and, and my, and my mom. We're going to go there. We're going to sit in the back. We're just going to observe. We're going to observe her. Like we don't, we're going to hide. She gets there, first, very first person that Angelique comes on stage, tells her stick, and then she goes, you. <laughs> I have a message for you. Incredible, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, my, we, my sister had hired Angelina. Angelina does private readings as well. And so she had hired her to come to our house the following week. But Jen was very nervous about it. You know, it, it can be a... Some people get it's very scary. Anxious. Yeah, for yeah some it can be scary for the first time. Um, so she was really anxious. So my sister discovered that Angelina was giving this group show at a theater that had a couple of hundred people. So she decided to go to that just so she could see what it was like. Having no, uh, uh, no uh, expectations of a reading whatsoever. In fact, she was sure she was not going to get one. So they sat as far back as they could just to observe. And sure enough, uh, Angelina gives uh, her opening talk where she talks about what she does. And then she comes across the stage and she points right at my sister and says, I'm with you. Uh, there's a, did your dad pass? And that was the first thing she said. And Jen, my sister can't even talk because she's, she's freaking out. Now someone hands her a microphone. And then Angelina says, he's standing behind you in a Red Sox shirt. Um, significant because not only was my dad a, a Red Sox fan, we buried him in his Red Sox shirt. Um, and, and then she gave a more detailed message that I won't go into now because it's a bit of a story, but it's in the book. Yeah. And that was the moment for the book, Jen. Love Dad. Sorry, the book is called Love Dad. That's called Love Dad, yeah. Yeah. Um, my sister had a moment where it basically she had talked to my dad that morning and said, dad, I want you to ha- I want you to give this specific message if, if this really is there just in case I happen to get a reading, which I won't. And then Angelina gave that very specific message and that that changed my sister's life uh, right then. And uh, and then I was going to have my turn next. Yeah. You went to their home, Angelina, but you didn't remember who they were. I guess you're in a zone when you give readings and you just don't even look like there's so many hundreds of people you go through. Yeah, you know, it's a very interesting process. If I had to absorb everything and everyone that I read, I wouldn't have my own life. Yeah. And it's an interesting (laughs) thing, you know, sometimes I'll be in the supermarket and someone will come up to me and go, hey, you did a reading for me. And then it's like, and then they'll email me later. (laughs) Yeah. And they'll, they'll go, you know, you seem different you know, you're different when you read and then when I meet you, you know, so it's like my person, I'm me when I'm, you know, myself going through the grocery store. But when you're preparing to read someone or be with spirit, you kind of have to let your mind go. You can't be in your own world. So I did not remember um, Jen. And it was interesting reading the wonderfully crafted book that Michael 
has written called Love Dad. Um, when I was rereading, I'm like, oh my God, I said that? Oh, I said that? I said, because it's not coming from me. You know, I had yeah, a client yeah. the other day and said, they said to me, how how do you know this? I go, I don't, it's coming from your loved one, you know? So I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't hold it. Yeah. yeah. I don't. It, it was like your mom had just passed too. I think when you had read for them and, or close to that time, I think Angelina, no, it's actually 2004, but yeah. But so, but, but he, he I, I remember in the book, you know, Mike, you're, you're talking about how Angelina's energy was, you know, very comforting, and that you believable, like you wanted not to believe her, but you believed her because she seemed real. Well, um, she seemed like genuine. Yeah. I mean, I certainly wanted to believe I wanted to. No, I know. The scientist in me is thinking, well, surely if this is real, if there's a woman out there who can communicate with dead people, surely one of my science teachers would have told me about something like <laughs> the that. two weeks that you took. <laughs> but the two weeks of uh, that I was a biology major, right? Um, so, so though I wanted to believe I was, uh, you know, I felt like that would have been on the front page news at some point yeah. if someone had just had discovered sure, it. Sure. Yeah. So what was interesting um, from Angelina's reading to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next was your maternal grandparents came through first, usually, and then your dad followed. So it's like, wake up, wake up. We're here. Hi. Did they, did they ever have like specific messages for you? Or was it just like, this guy's here with us and he's going to come through. Yeah. That was one of the extraordinary things that um, really blew me away. It, it was the patterns that showed up. So after we had the reading with Angelina, uh, we I then had sittings with two other mediums and in all three of those cases, the pattern of the way that the people, sh the spirits showed up was the same. It was my maternal grandparents, maternal grandparents, and then my father. And that happened in all three readings. And I couldn't understand. The chances of that being coincidence uh, are very small, statistically sure. very small. Uh, and unless it's like you wanted to call an actuary every time. <laughs> what, what? Yeah. Right. I, know, right. I know, by the way, I know, by the way, why that happened. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yes, because spirit knows whom they're communicating with. And Mike is very scientific. Mm. So it doesn't happen that way with everybody. And I believe certain spirits come through for a reason with an intention. And I believe after I, I read that, because I didn't know about the other patterns with the other mediums. And I'm like, that's an interesting thing. It fits into who Mike is, you know. And on another note, too, you know, to have someone who's so loving and caring like Mike, but so smart, be able to demonstrate in that book his journey from not believing and being very scientific. I can't tell you, I, I, there's been many clients that have called me that are very scientific minded after reading Mike's book and it's opened up their lives. Nice. You know, and I haven't had a chance to say this to Mike that, you know, some people might read the book and go, oh my God, he's so smart. He's like, I, I'm reading some of these words. He's I'm like, I don't have to look this up in a dictionary. Like he's so smart, but he's hitting another segment of folks who would just like Mike go medium medium. Come yeah. on. You yeah. know, I, I did a reading on a woman the other day whose father came through and he kept on showing, he looked at me with disdain, like you're talking to a medium. What's the matter with you daughter? Like, cause he didn't believe in mediums, but then he showed me a lake and a drive and I'm not smart enough for him. He was trying to say lake, drive view where they live. So it shows us that we maintain our intelligence when we pass. Mm -hmm. So I believe, long story short, the reason why that pattern happened is because look who's being read. It's someone who's very intelligent and the patterns would confirm that for him. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I had a thought while you said that and then it just went away. It's unfortunate. Um, right. Interesting. Okay. So you start, you're starting to become a believer, kind of. Yeah. Oh, I mean, oh, sorry. Oh, I know what it was. Did you ever go to Lilydale? I don't, you never said it in the book, but I was just curious if you ever went there. I, ha I haven't yet, but I'm, I will, I will be. Have you been there, Angelina? I have not, but I do have colleagues that work there. Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, it okay. Is. So um, for those who don't know what it is, it's a community full of psychics and mediums and um they take up residence usually in the summertime and, and you guys can go there if you want. Anyway. Um, okay. So 
you af- after those three psychics and you're you're finding your way um you're continuing on your journey and you met i know you went to england but who wh- what was the name of the woman that you met uh, or do you want to go somewhere else first uh the journalist is leslie kane leslie kane that's it yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 so you read her her work yeah I, to- yeah happened to stumble upon her book in a Barnes and Noble. Uh, I was at a Starbucks there. I wasn't there for the books that day. I was just there uh, learning lines for, uh, I'm, I'm an actor sometimes, so I was getting ready to do a show. Um, and then I went to go to the bathroom and there was this book, you know, how every once in a while they have a book facing out and it was surviving death. A, a journalist investigates evidence for the afterlife. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I, I picked the book up, read it from cover to cover, and most of the stuff in it I had already been aware of from my, from my own journey, except the last part of it. Uh, the last couple of chapters are about something called physical mediumship. So we, we can divide mediumship into two categories is one way to do this. And there's mental mediumship, which is what Angelina does, right? Where she, you're getting um, images or feelings or, or tastes, you know, and then you're interpreting these things while you're uh, at least in a semi-conscious state. Right. You know, Angelina doesn't go into deep trance, you know, she's- No, she's playing yeah. charades. <laughs> yeah, you're right, right. Psychic charades as, as Angelina s- s- calls it. Um, yeah. So with physical mediumship, the claim is that the medium goes into an even deeper um, level of trance. So it's a a much different state of consciousness than waking consciousness. And we do have confirmation of this uh, in that we've hooked up physical mediums to uh, electroencephalograph machines, EEG machines, and we know that brainwave patterns do change. Mm -hmm. So something is happening something we can say scientifically something is happening um at least in some cases so uh and uh leslie kane writes about this man named Stuart alexander who's a physical medium and then the claim that might be hard for some people to believe depending on (laughs) where you fall on the on the spectrum of beliefs here uh is that some people once they're in this deep state of trance their body produces a substance uh that the spirit world claims is partially spirit and partially physical uh, that is called ectoplasm. Now, when I read that, I had to stifle a laugh because I knew the word ectoplasm from Ghostbusters. I was sure that Harold Ramis had invented the word ectoplasm and it was the slimy stuff that, you know, Slimer left on the bookshelves at the library. But according to Leslie, it was a real substance. Now, Leslie is a New York Times journalist, right? She is one of the brightest people I know, highly credentialed. Her word is her whole livelihood. You know, Mm -hmm. she cannot, she has to be very careful about what she says and even more careful about what she puts into print. And it was only because I trusted her completely and her word that I gave any credence to this at all. Um, Because according to Leslie, this this man, Stuart, and other physical mediums, uh, especially in times earlier past, uh, are able to exude enough ectoplasm that the spirit world can sort of dip their etheric body, their spirit body, for lack of a better word, into this stuff and then physically materialize in the room so that everyone sitting in the room can see them and hear them. So instead of having a a mental medium having to interpret for you Mm -hmm. the impressions they're getting, you're able to talk to them directly standing in the room. Now that I was sure could not possibly be true without me knowing about it. (laughs) How could it be? And then I was stunned to discover that some of our brightest scientists in the history of science have looked into this stuff deeply, not just looked into it, but spent a lifetime looking into it. The guy who gave, who coined the word ectoplasm, a guy named Charles Roche was a Nobel prize winner in physiology. Okay, he won the Nobel Prize for physiology. And he said that ectoplasm is a real thing that he studied and he was able to cut a piece basically and study it in a lab uh, mm-hmm. made of white blood cells and lycocytes and other, wow. other things. Um, but anyway, it's, it's incredible to read. And to my, uh, through a series of, of, of events that have to have been my dad, Uh, less than a year after finding that book and reading about that extraordinary chapter, I was sitting in a room with that journalist in a small town in England with Stuart Alexander about to have a physical seance. And then I saw something that entirely 
changed uh, my sense of reality. Um, I describe it thoroughly in the book, you what did? happened. Um, and all I can tell you for people, you know, if, if there's any uh, function that I serve the way that I see it uh, between Angelina and, and maybe the hard skeptics is sort of being a bridge, sort of like I'm kind of this average everyman type person. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle. And um, all I can tell you is that what you read in the book is 100% true. I swear to God, what happened in the book, what I, what I wrote in the book is what happened. I was sitting beside Leslie when it happened. She vouches for this. She saw it as well as the other seven people in the room. It happened. It just happened. So, and because it happened and because I saw it and we all saw it, I now know that no matter how intelligent a scientist might be, you know, because we so easily ascribe authority to people, right? If you put a couple of letters behind their name, or if you put them in a lab coat, it's very easy to take what they say as the ultimate reality. And if a if a, a guy like Neil deGrasse Tyson, right, who's sort of the right now the public face of science, or Bill Nye, maybe you know, one mm -hmm. of those guys, if they tell you there's no such thing as life after death because science says it's not possible, it's pretty easy for the average person to say, okay, it's not possible. That guy who clearly is very studied, he says mm -hmm. it's not possible. But now I know without a doubt that no matter how many letters a person has behind their name, no matter how many Nobel prizes they have, if they tell you that there is no such thing as anything quote unquote paranormal, they're wrong. They're just wrong. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's the fact. And it's, it drives me mad that they don't know about it because that's what science is supposed to be. We observe something happen in the natural world, and then we figure out what it is and how and why it's happening. Right. But the first step in science is observation. That's the first step. I, I literally had a scientist say to me, it can't be possible because it can't be possible. <laughs> what, what does that mean? That can, that, no scientist should ever say something like that, especially where we are right now. This gets me all excited, but like where we are right now. Sorry, yeah. Go no, go I was ahead. just gonna say that, you know, you see that a lot in the medical community because doctors are very uncurious if that's a word. And, and so they go, no, that's not possible or that can't happen. And of course, you know, it can happen. Anything is possible in this world. I, I do believe that. I just want to read one thing. Um, Angelina, I'm going to read this out because Gary Schwartz, the, that, um, uh, the mediumship afterlife test that you went through. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit about that. Gary Schwartz describes um, a major contemporary study of mediumship under controlled conditions in his 2002 book, The Afterlife Experiments, Breakthrough Scientific Evidence of Life After Death. His work, in fact, constitutes the most tightly controlled recent scientific investigations into mediumship yet achieved. His uh, Schwartz's impressive background as a professor of psychology, medicine, neurology, psychiatry, and surgery at the University of Arizona, director of its Human Energy Systems Laboratory and publisher of over 400 scientific papers. He said you're the real deal. Well, that, it's quite um, an you must honor. Be. <laughs> well, it's an honor, but you know, it's all evidence-based, isn't it? You know, yeah. I met Gary through the Forever Family Foundation, which is a not-for-profit that was started by some friends of mine who lost, well, they became friends after I sure. professionally to know them, who lost a daughter when she was 15 in a car accident. And what I found about learning about the scientific world, um, I'm the first certified medium from them. They're actually in the same Netflix um, documentary that Mike's in, they're in episode four. And what I've learned from the scientific community working with them all these years, because I've also been involved with the University of Virginia, and, um, is that there are a rare few scientists that will take the leap. Science is funded. And if a scientist says something wackadoodle, let's say, yeah, yeah. Um, they'll lose their funding. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Forever Family Foundation is so important. That's why Gary in my life professionally is important because they took the risk. And that's why Mike, is important on a personal level, I consider him a friend, but his daring book, I think it's a daring book to write, even in this day, to take someone who is very bright, like he is, like Gary is, I, I put him in that category, to take that leap and that step. Um, and it does come from evidence. 
that's the whole idea. You, when you read Mike's book, it's all evidence-based. Mm -hmm. And you could even see his wheels turning, like, how could this be? And then there's another piece of evidence. And that's the thing about Gary Schwartz, having the honor of working with him, is he did a triple blind study where we would sit across from folks. And the first thing would be us just channeling spirit. They couldn't say anything. They would just write notes in our accuracy. The second part was they would say yes or no. And then the third part was the scientist himself. They would call spirit discarnates and they would talk directly to the discarnate and ask specific questions like, well, Miss Diana, you're speaking with so-and-so. Ask him what kind of clothes does he wear to work every day? And what we found was that the same level of accuracy was present when we were reading the grieving and the scientists themselves, which shows when evidence is present and there's an open channel and there's belief from that evidence, we get high scores. Yeah, and so it was such an honor to work with him and also to still be involved with the Forever Family Foundation. They work really hard with grieving folks, but they're scientifically based. So it's a That's wonderful- That's good to group. know. I just, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I have interviewed a few families you know, dads specifically who lost children. And it's very, very hard. They're supposed to protect their kids. And so I think they yeah. take it extra hard. And, uh, you know, one, one individual, he went on a journey like you did, Mike, mm. just psychic after psychic, because he wanted to talk to his son. He just wanted to find him, talk to him. Are you okay? And, sure. and he did. And so, you know, it was really beautiful. And I just had connected one dad with him last week, because uh, his daughter was was taken and uh he can't believe it so yeah. it's you know you gotta you gotta connect yeah i talked yeah. to animals and so i i found that where like I, t I did a course in it and you know talk about like you can't ask the animal is that correct however you can ask the owner if it's correct you know so you, you like i connected with a cat in england who who told me that you know there was always classical music going on and and they saw white and blah 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 and it turns out their owner was a classical pianist and you know what like yeah angelina well, think, connects uh, sorry angelina you connect with animals right you you do that as well I, I i do i connect with them in spirit but in life too and i think it's an important thing to discern the difference between a psychic and a medium. Yes. Um, a, yes. a psychic, because I've, I've spoken to many scientists and, you know, some that don't believe and they'll go, well, you're just connecting to psi theory. And I'm like, well, prove psi theory. Psi theory is, is that supposedly all the uh, uh, Kashkic records, it, all the information that's ever lived is out there swimming around in the universe. Mm -hmm. And that's what was so important about Gary's information um, to discern the difference between a psychic mm -hmm. and a medium. If you're connecting to a living animal like you are, mm -hmm. it's psychic. It's, it's psychic. Two -way, it's two-way conversation. And, yeah. and, and and animals are very, they love us unconditionally. They're very empathic. I often say cats are psychic. Dogs are empathic, uh, you know, because cat will look at you and go, I don't like it because I just don't like how you feel. Dogs will, you know, nuzzle them, their nose under your wrist and say you're having a bad day. Um, so yes, Mike, I do work with living animals, which is psychic. And I also have had some very intriguing situations that have happened with animals and spirit, um, which is similar to uh, mediumship and connecting to humans that have crossed over. I mean, there's so many interesting things in this world that a lot of people haven't heard about. And I had a, I, I used to belong to a spiritualist church. So at the spiritualist mm -hmm. church, you're always giving readings, getting readings, giving healings, getting healings. And, and I think with the open attitude towards spirit and, and mediumship, um, it's very interesting. So they brought this woman over from England who does flower readings. And she has a flower, she has a flower guide. So at the beginning of a day, you go and you, and you grab a flower and you hold that flower very close to your body all day long. And then later that day, we took her the flowers in a room. They weren't like, all they had was a number on them. So that like a ticket, I got half a ticket. She got half a ticket. She had no idea who we were, uh, but they had to identify a flower to a person. So at the end of the day, she goes, okay, she holds up the flower and she gave incredible information about the person who who had kept that flower all day long i took my husband because he's kind of a he's not a skeptic but he's kind of a eh, maybe and he's like what like he was really blown away that she could wow. take this flower and so she described her little flower 
um, let's call her flower fairy, um, that talks to her, but she is a medium. She was a definite medium, but she, this is something else that she did these flower readings mm-hmm. with, with this little, I don't know what you call her. Anyway, it was really incredible, but there, people don't hear about stuff like that. It's true. I used to do, go to um, retreats in the Bahamas to study as a medium. And that sounds like an English medium that I worked with. Her name was Anne Burbridge. I don't know if it's the same one, but she would do flower readings. I too. think her name was Anne. I don't, Burbridge doesn't yeah, sound Anne, familiar, but Anne, Anne, Anne does. Anne, it sounds like the reading. She older? She, a little bit older? Yeah, yes. yeah it could have been her. And, and what was intriguing about her is she made, she specifically made, and I think Mike would appreciate this, she specifically did this to demonstrate the difference between our energy, the living force energy that we're in, a psychic reading, and then connecting to mediumship, someone who's passed. And and I really appreciated watching her do that because it helped me understand the difference when Mm -hmm. you're sitting across from someone and you're picking up their energy. It's a life force energy, a two-way conversation versus when you're working with spirit, you, you are working with a living grieving person, which takes some time and energy to understand grief. So you respect them, but yeah. actually you have to block their energy because you don't want to read them psychically. Right. You want to read the personality, the intention, the, the, the life journey of someone who's made that transition to heaven. So I really appreciate you mentioning that because it's making me remember Anne and how she was, she's such a good medium that she wanted to demonstrate the difference. So we would understand as practitioners, because the worst call I get is the person um, that says, I sat with a medium. They asked me for a picture. They, yeah. You know, all this stuff that they told me there was a curse around me. I paid oh them $1,500. You know, that's not a that. medium. yeah, that's not a medium. And again, I'll hearken back to the wonderful work that Mike has done with Love Dad. Um, I was in tears reading it because it is so good yeah. to see his transition that he knows his dad is with him. That's number one. But to, to go on that journey with him with this book and see his transformation gives so many hope to people, you know, that have had similar tragic losses, you know. It's not just it, their loss, but it's, it, it, it takes um, the fear of death for a lot true. of people away. True. That's true, too. What That's happens fair. when I die? It's the biggest question in the world. What happens when I die? Well, now you know what happens when you die. You're yes. still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's wonderful to pick the brain of Mike Anthony about yeah. it because it's very specific. I'm going to toot his horn yep, until yep. I cross over because it's very true. So yeah, I just want to say fun. MikeAnthony.com. Is that your website? Yes. Yep. AngelinaDiana.com, your website? Yes. Get a reading, get a book. <laughs> we got it. We're out of time, but. You guys have been phenomenal. Thank you so very much for being my guest today. And thanks, Angelina, for being a special guest, coming on so quickly and, and saying yes for Mike. Because I think it really helps um, to have both your stories confirm one another. And it's just so interesting. It's so interesting. And all the things, you know, how come nobody told you, Mike? There's so many things in this world that nobody tells us. Sure. What happened? What Did you ever go to Area 51? <laughs> It's, oh yeah oh yeah i drove down there sure no, yeah. that's crazy <laughs> the five dollar martians in the museum i mean that's just crazy stuff but <laughs> that's funny stuff but we're gonna say goodbye to facebook goodbye folks thanks for thanks for tuning in to us today i really appreciate it all right i'm just gonna stop our recording